Carpe diem, baby. Let's seize the day. My high school Latin taught me at least that. Uh, welcome to the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University, Rome U Works, Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, Ben Barry. You know the principles, but we have a special guest from the best show ever. You see him on your TV screen or on your radio every day. Ty, you are really balancing the airwaves in a way that not many people can. It is Ty Johnson, friend of the podcast, back having some fun with us. Ty, we appreciate you waking up and, and getting with us here in this early podcast recording. No, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. It's great to be back on the Sixers Talk podcast. Hey, bro, Um, the Sixers Talk show, just a lot of that background just brings it all back for me about, you know, you and Crystal Rich and how much we used to talk shop about Sixers. And I will be hear your opinions on the record, off the record, the whole thing. So this is definitely uh, cathartic and uh, definitely brings back a lot of memories um, Noah Levick is here. He was uh, in Atlanta. He was in uh, Brooklyn covering the team. And here we are with the Brooklyn Bridges series here with uh, Mikhail Bridges coming back into the fray. And Ty, I'm really curious about if you pick the Sixers to come out of the East at the start of the season, who you did pick. And let's just start there and see if what where your projection sits after the regular season um to be completely honest i picked the celtics in the very beginning of the season because yeah, they no, made the, pick the celtics and the bucks so don't don't feel like <laughs> yeah i picked the celtics um uh, they were good last year they got better they added some guys the brogdon addition which has hurt the sixers directly when they play head to head i thought they were going to be the best team and they looked like they were the best team for several months this year and then after the all-star break they just haven't been the same team And we'll find out, probably we'll find out in the second round whether or not that was a situation where it was a team that was bored trying to get to the postseason. Was there, they had to make a coaching change and all that drama that it finally catch up to them. But initially, I thought the Celtics would be the best team. And they actually underachieved relative to what I thought, despite the fact that they're a two seed. Okay. So Celtics were the original team. So Charles Barkley, after uh, the Hawks, um, won that series against Miami. He came out on uh, <laughs> the uh, show and was just came out flat and said, you know what? The only real question in this only real good series is that Nixon Cavalier series. And the only real question here in the Eastern Conference is if the Sixers can beat the Celtics. So I, I thought that that was a great point because we haven't seen the Sixers beat the Celtics in the playoffs. We haven't seen them um overcome that obstacle when it mattered during the regular season. So can the Sixers beat the Celtics in the second round? And and the issue is, can I answer your question with the question, which I know you shouldn't do? Can Maxi, is he capable of having a good game against that Celtics team when they have everybody? Because the way I'm looking at it is I'm I'm thinking of a scenario where Embiid legitimately averages 35 points a game in a series against the Celtics, legitimately. And Harden gets you roughly 20 and 10 against the Celtics, legitimately. But if Maxie does what he did in the regular season, I don't see how they would have a path to actually winning. But if you tell me that Maxie can unlock something we haven't seen, then they would have a shot because they make Maxie work on the other end, on the defensive side. They throw a lot of size and strength at him on the offensive side. They really take him out of the game. And a lot of the looks that he was getting, especially in the last performance when Embiid went nuts with the 52 points, those were clean looks that he still managed to miss. So then that makes me wonder if there's a mental component against just that opponent. Not that he's mentally weak or anything like that. Does he have a mental component to his struggles against the Celtics specifically? If Maxi can play well, the Sixers can beat the Celtics. If Maxi doesn't play well, I don't see a real path because their quote big three would be better than the this, this Sixers big three, and they have a better bench. Yeah, those are those are great points. I think with Maxi, I tend to believe in him to overcome any little mental speed bumps. I think he's just been extraordinarily impressive for a young kid, and has a ton of innate self confidence, but also is realistic with his self-assessments and i'm sure if the sixers face boston he will pour over that film and see where he was weak and uh try to you know solve those particular issues but 
Yeah, for me, the second units uh, would be a concern in that series, most likely, especially if George Niang continues to be a key factor. I think Doc Rivers generally continued to ride with him against Boston, and it just doesn't look like a great matchup for him because that's a team with a lot of athleticism that can make him you know, look rather weak defensively. Uh, and I think if Niang's not knocking down shots, uh, you wonder whether uh, Daniel House Jr. can pick up some of the slack there, whether Jalen McDaniels can provide the two-way impact the Sixers envisioned when they picked him up. So no doubt Boston is a difficult matchup in multiple ways, and I think that's absolutely correct. Tyrese Maxey is most likely an X factor in that series, and that's a lot to ask from someone who – though extraordinarily mature for his age, still his third year in the NBA. He's still just 22 years old. And the Sixers, in all likelihood, uh, need him to be really great if they're going to be the defending Eastern Conference champions. We're here with Todd Johnson from Sixers Outsiders, formerly, of course, of the best show ever on 97.5, The Fanatic. And, yes, we are talking about the second round. We previewed the first round a bit on our Sixers podcast earlier in the week. Um, I gave it a 20% chance that the Brooklyn Nets make something happen here against the Sixers. Noah was like, pump your brakes, Danny. It's more like a 5% chance that something happens. Where do you think the chances are of the Brooklyn Nets? Because, you know, it's funny. The NBA, there's not a lot of parity. You don't have the upsets. It's like the upper echelon teams are the ones with the stars and have the best chances of winning a championship. There's nothing – I'm not saying anything uh, controversial when I say that, but what what percent chance do you give the Brooklyn Nets of coming in and, and upsetting the Sixers? Um, three three to five percent. Um, <laughs> the, the Sixers have obviously the two best players. Um, no, the two best players in the series. What three of the best four? Like nothing against Mikael Bridges, who has turned into a fantastic player, but this is the first time he's entering the playoffs as the guy, and he is the guy on that team. And I take nothing away from him. He defends, but he's only one guy. And then you have a situation where the Nets have guys that play either offense or defense. Like Dinwiddie can play offense, but he's not going to D up. Uh, Finney Smith will play defense, won't play a lot of offense. We know about Curry and Joe Harris. I just don't see a legitimate path to them winning the series. Now, can they make the series interesting? At times, in some of the games, interesting. I think Jock Vaughn's done a really good job, um, but they can't win the series. The Sixers are going to win the series. It's going right. to be Sixers Celtics in the second round. It's just a matter of do the Sixers stay healthy, and hopefully, this is a bit of a maxi series, so he's feeling as good as he possibly can be entering that Celtics series. When we look at the matchup between the the Nets and Sixers. I love the close proximity stuff, you know, like our fans going there and their fans coming here. Is there any potential of the Brooklyn fans coming to South Philly and grabbing some seats and and causing some ruckus? Is is that even a factor, do you think, in in how the series plays out? Okay. Will some Nets fans come down? Yes. But the ones that can afford to come down aren't the type that can create ruckus. So you are picking one or the other. You're either getting ruckus, but they're not coming, or you're getting fans that come here, and then they're the wine and cheese crowd, and they're not <laughs> going to cause much of a ruckus. That crowd is a weird crowd. It's going to take – I think it's still a – they're going to take another generation. Like, it took Toronto a long time to get, like, those kids that grew up watching hockey that switched over to basketball, and now you see what kind of atmosphere that they are able to have in that. I think the Nets are still years away from having a real fan base. Those are all Knicks fans in disguise or people that moved to Williamsburg and just walked there. Like, that's not a real fan base. I don't think that's a big factor unless somehow they were able to win both games in Philadelphia. If they won, if they were up 2-0 and it went to Brooklyn, okay, at that point. But I I just don't really see that happening. On the flip side, bro, we definitely have seen the Sixers fans take over Barclays Center, Noah, what do you what do you think the percentage chance of something like that happening? The Nets fans not showing up because maybe the Sixers did take the first two games, and then that game three and four is just like South South Philly and, and uh, Brooklyn. I think they'll they'll show up. We won't be looking at half empty arenas, but 
Uh, I think most definitely if the Sixers are ahead in the series and gain momentum, uh, the Philly contingent will make themselves known. But it is interesting just thinking back to that 2019 series because to me the most memorable fan aspect of that is the Sixers getting booed really loudly in game one because they disappointed in a series where they were strongly favored. And rather ironically, Ben Simmons was the target of many of those boos. I think he was like one for six from the foul line, had a tough game, and then made the comment afterwards of if you're going to boo, then stay on that side. But hey, he did bounce back nicely in the series. The Sixers won the next four games, and Simmons had some brilliant performances and I think enjoyed the little Jared Dudley subplot there. But uh, look, the Sixers are held to a high standard pretty consistently from their fans. And I think Sixers fans quite correctly expect them to take care of business in round one against a team that is just not nearly as talented as, as the Sixers are. No, you bring up something that I was definitely trying to get into, which is the history between these two teams. And one of the things that I remember specifically is I forget if it, what game it was exactly, but a photo a video of Joel and B getting some fast food um, or having like a bag of fast food, getting back on like a sprinter van or something like that after the game. And so many people talking about, you know, his weight and conditioning and what he eats and nutrition and all of those things. But Amy Fadul did an interview with Doc Rivers that we'll see on Saturday uh, before uh, the Sixers game at one on Sixers pregame live 1230 on NBC Sports Philadelphia. And Doc said that he when he first met Joel, they had a dinner in the, his first season here in Philly. And Doc asked Joel, have you ever seen any fat MVPs? And Joel's like, well, what you trying to call me fat? He was like, no, no, I'm I'm not. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just asking you, have you ever seen any fat MVPs? And of course, Nikola Jokic a little soft in some areas. But at that time, it held a lot of weight, you know, and Nikola Jokic has lost a lot of weight. So give him credit for that. But I think it makes a good point of the Joel we used to know and the Joel we know now um, and how far he's come. Um, Noah, get, reflect on that a little bit because we're going to assume this is his MVP season just because of the momentum and way things are trending. Um, maybe some voter fatigue with Nikola Jokic, but that, that is a, a large chasm that he has leaped. And it, I don't know if we can put enough superlatives on what he's become from if we think about where he was then and, and what he is now. Yeah, that was a really strange season for him physically because – He played in the All-Star game, then sat out, I believe, eight straight after it, which was a source of justified controversy. And that left knee was bothering him to a significant degree throughout the playoffs, even missed game three of the Brooklyn series. And some of that, as always, is just bad luck with picking up injuries in games. But yeah, you bounce back quicker from that stuff when you're in better shape. And I think he he would tell you the same. He also commented recently just that he has less concern now with coming back from an extended absence. So, of course, he sat out the Sixers last two games and he's like, yeah, I'm not I'm not worried about being in peak shape when I return. Um, It's just so much easier for him to get back in the flow of things because he has put so much work into his diet and his conditioning, hired the personal chef, nutritionist and I think recognize that that was a relative weakness for him. Again, as you said, it's not like he was grotesquely overweight or I think even struggling late in games to the degree that some would say, but yeah, he had a significant amount that he could improve there and he took, he took the steps to uh, get it done. And that's a big reason that he looks on track for, for the MVP award, but He will just hope for better luck this time around. I think he's controlled everything he can as far as being in shape and avoiding, you know, any, anything negative on that front, but he's just had terrible luck in the postseason with injuries. You you can't really like do anything about getting hit in the face by Siakam, you know, late in a blowout game last year in Toronto. So uh, if he finally gets a little bit of that luck, I think, the Sixers' odds 
clearly improved substantially, and they won't have to wonder about how you know Paul Reed might fare in a spot start or uh, what Doc Rivers would do if Joel Embiid were sidelined for a couple games. Uh, he's no doubt their franchise cornerstone, and just him being on the court you genuinely believe this is a team that can beat anyone that's in front of them. Ty, definitely a a large chasm that he's leaped between then and now. Um, I'm going to assume he's your MVP. He is my MVP for mainly because of the defensive end. We know everything leading the score, leading the league in scoring. You can look at some of the box score stuff. If you watch the games, just the impact he has defensively, Like one of the things that impressed me in that Celtics game that we already mentioned earlier where he scored the 52 points were some of those sets by design, he was guarding Tatum. And I'm just imagining what if Jokic, for example, was by design having to guard Tatum in the half court. Like it just wouldn't happen. It just would not happen. And he just does things on the other end that I don't think he gets enough credit for, for to me. And also Jokic missed some games this year because that used to be the, the gap. I think he's the MVP. With the chasm you just mentioned, though, Think back to that Nets uh, Sixers series that you mentioned, Danny. Think about at the time we're saying B needs to get in better shape and Simmons needs to shoot. Mm. That was the big thing between those two guys. It was like Simmons. One, one of those things happened. Right. And the crazy thing is, as you know, you're playing the Nets. Obviously, Simmons not a factor, not going to play in the series. Just imagine if Simmons – for regardless of how or why or you believe the reason why it didn't happen, imagine if he developed his weakness the way Joel B developed his weakness. And to me, that's one of the big things in this series is that one guy had a clear flaw, worked on that flaw, got better at that particular thing. You could say it was easier than shooting, but it's really hard to shoot a basketball for a basketball player. Like you would think Simmons thing actually would have been easier. Instead, he, the guy is so much better now than he was then. And Simmons is so much worse than he was then. To me, that I can't get past that as they prepare for a net series. I'm not going to speculate as to why those things didn't happen with Ben Simmons. There's been a number of different things said, uh, injuries, mental health, whatever it is. But the gap between what indeed has, how much he's grown and how Simmons didn't grow, instead he regressed, to me is just mind-blowing. No, definitely. If you're a basketball player, you would assume, you know, shooting the basketball and doing things that you've done in the past will come easier than changing your diet and all the things that we had heard about Joel and B with the Shirley Temples and the food rotting in his fridge and, you know, the choices he was making. So I'm definitely going to side with you on that one. Um, let's pay some bills here real quick, because uh, a lot more to get into here on the Sixers Talk podcast. Of course, we are brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilm U works. Wilmington University and students are in the game, upskill in fields like cybersecurity, fintech, healthcare, and education in person or online. Get in the game at Wilmington University. Find us at wilmu.edu. Injured for over 70 years, Lundy Law has been the number one personal injury law firm in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Their services are exemplary. Their results are exceptional. Call 1-800-LUNDY-LAW to get the money you deserve. It's time to rush to new rewards at Rivers Casino. Now there's a whole new way for you to earn, redeem, and level up your rewards. Get your new Rush Rewards card and get more out of your game at Rivers Casino, Philadelphia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Um, back here on the Sixers Talk podcast, uh, Mark Jackson was doing a, a bit for us on Sportsnet Central uh, preview in the series and he called it the Sixers Big Four. So I'm saying, hmm, okay, so I guess that's Tobias Harris, Maxi Hart, and Embiid. Um, I thought that was interesting the way he phrased that, but more so, I feel like, do you feel like Tobias Harris deserves to be in that conversation with those guys? What have you seen from him here after the All-Star break tie? Do you feel like he's giving you enough and – are you expecting him to be a uh, sort of an X factor and step his game up and be more reliable here in the playoffs? I actually do. Now he didn't play great ball after the all-star break, but also you had the situation where Max, he's not a starter. Then he's a starter again. And a lot of stuff they had to do that doc had to do was sort of cater to him. And obviously the ball goes through hard and beat. So being the fourth option like that, and then his role changing every single year he's been here, I don't think that's the easiest thing in the world to do. But 
I do trust that he's going to defend in the playoffs. I do trust that he's going to rebound and play hard, and he's long. So I actually think he's going to have a factor. Like, I think in large stretch, he's going to be guarding Bridges in the net series, for example. And I think he's going to end up doing a pretty good job. I, I think Tobias, in, if you took away his contract, we would look at Tobias, to me, completely different. He sacrificed for the team. He never complains. He's durable and he's always out there. It's just that he gets paid so much money that people think he stinks when in actuality he's just overpaid. Like imagine a car that gets you A to B all the time, but you just had to pay extra money for it. It's more that than a car that doesn't get the job done. So I actually do think Tobias sometimes get a gets a bit of a bad rap because he does do quality things. He's just getting paid a lot of money to be a fourth option. Were you adding the Tobias Harris discussion, Noah? Yeah, I think that's pretty pretty well summed up. I do think uh, he has encouraged, you know, been encouraging defensively for the most part. Uh, I think, yeah, you feel decent about him as an option against Bridges, uh, and he's given the Sixers some really good minutes also against uh, Tatum and Brown this regular season. But conversely, the one semi-meaningful Sixers-Nets game this year, I think he was one for nine from the floor. I think he had a two for 10, two for 11 outing against Boston in February. So I don't think the Sixers can really tolerate those sort of efforts against high quality opponents. I think for him, he understands the volume is going to be lower and he has to his credit accepted that, but the efficiency can't be abysmal or else that's probably going to cost the Sixers games. But it is interesting to me, just this point of where he's spaced on the court uh, for that Boston game, obviously, P.J. Tucker shifted to the corner. Harris went to the dunker spot and, you know, asked Rivers about that last week. And he said, yeah, that's essentially going to be the preference moving forward. Although, of course, spacing happens organically and they feel fine with either guy because both are good three-point shooters. But, OK, if Harris is going to be in the dunker spot, uh, they need him to be really solid with those little nuances of his movement off the ball. Uh, they need him to finish well when he gets a rare opportunity inside uh, and they just need him to play that role. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons to be confident about PJ Tucker taking and making clutch corner threes, but Harris and the dunker, uh, that's going to be an important little storyline here. I think in the playoffs for the Sixers, uh, I'm not so high on his rebounding and how he copes with physicality from high level opponents. So uh, let's see if he can prove his work there with an occasional key offensive board or two. Uh, and let's see just how well he can fill that number four role essentially for the Sixers. And as we've talked about, maybe it's necessary for him to step up as a number two or number three scorer uh, on nights where Harden or Maxi are struggling and perhaps Harris needs a little more volume and they need to go to him with that ISO game in the post. Uh, so he's, been extraordinarily willing to be adaptable and to fill whatever role the team needs, but I'm not so sure whether he can fill all those roles that will be asked of him successfully. Um, but I think he's an under the radar, really important player for this team. And yeah, we don't don't overlook that, whether or not we label him a big four member or not. And I think that's getting back to our Celtics discussion. That's the thing I see from them that. You know, sometimes it comes down to the hustle plays, the little intangible things, and they have those guys that can just come in and hit a timely shot or dive on a loose ball. I, You know, Derek White, Marcus Smart, Al Horford, guys outside of Tatum, you know, and Jalen Brown who come in and make these difference making defensive stops and things like that, which, you know, maybe isn't the Sixers forte outside of you know, a couple of guys. So those are things that I think make the difference between the Sixers and Celtics in the second round, but we will be much more in the Sixers favor here in the first round against Brooklyn because Brooklyn just can't match up with the Sixers, but there is an X factor we haven't talked about and it can come to fruition in series like the Celtics. I feel like um, the Brooklyn series, the Nets are just overmatched when it comes to the Sixers, but a, Coach is only as good as his players. So a lot of these things on the floor, um, the the players will determine. It'll be how can they stop Joel? Is James Harden, you know, in his playmaking bag? And are they slowing down Mikhail Bridges, et cetera? But 
when you look at what happened in the Sixers in the Hawks series debacle when they were able to come back and, and beat the Sixers in multiple games and win on the Sixers home floor, there were coaching adjustments that could probably have been made to kind of stem the tide, to change the momentum, you know, what, what, what have you, scheme adjustments or what have you. I am not as concerned personally about Jacques Vaughn versus Doc Rivers. I don't consider Jacques Vaughn as experienced or a coach who's well uh, versed and can um, navigate uh, what's been a topsy-turvy season for Brooklyn past the 76ers in the first round. Definitely have concerns maybe with Doc Rivers in the later rounds. The Doc Rivers-Jacques Vaughn matchup. Noah, what do you think about them matching wits? And are you at all concerned with uh, uh, being Doc Rivers maybe being out schemed in some areas by Jacques Vaughn? Yeah, not, not in this matchup, as you said. I think even in round two, obviously Joe Mazzulla is not right. the most it's not the the world either, um, you know, presuming that Boston gets through that. So, yeah, look, I think Rivers has done overall a very good job this season. Sixers have the NBA's best record since early December, and it was a very disappointing start, but he pretty much nailed all the gut feel sort of decisions on who do you go to in this spot, who do you close extra wide game with, and I, I think he's going into the playoffs – uh, with some positive momentum, but coaches are always tested in the postseason, not expecting a lot of easy decisions on his plate necessarily. Uh, but just looking exclusively at round one with no, yeah, no disrespect to Jock Vaughn, I don't think I envision him, you know, outwitting Doc Rivers in a dramatic way that, you know, vaults Brooklyn to a uh, incredible series upset. I think uh, in all likelihood, Rivers will do a solid job in this series and the Sixers will uh, get the job done against the Mets. Ty, where are you at on that? You feel the same? I see you nodding your head. Yeah, Jock Vaughn, I think he's done a good job, but he doesn't have the players to do it. Like Nick Nurse used to be, oh, look how great he is. Ever since uh, Kawhi's left, he hasn't been so great. It's At the end of the day, it's most about the players, and the Sixers players are so much better than the Nets players that I don't think that's going to be a factor. Could it be a factor in the second round? Sure, but I don't think it could be. A, it will be a factor because I just don't think they had, the Nets have good enough players to even make it even in, in the realm of possibility for me. Uh, fellas, we're going to get out of here. Ty has some other responsibilities he has to get to. Uh, we uh, want to, we'll be remiss if we didn't mention uh, Joel Embiid, Eastern Conference Player of the Month for March and April. I think that is the rubber stamp on his MVP race. Uh, of course, Doc Rivers, Coach of the Month for the last stretch, uh, March and April. And the Sixers have the most wins in the NBA uh, over that stretch, 15 and 7. They were uh, with 10 row games uh, mixed in. So, uh, we appreciate you, Ty, for stopping by. Hopefully we'll speak with you again here in the postseason. Um, have a great show today. Noah Levick, check out his work on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. For Ben Barry, I'm Danny Pommels. This has been the Sixers Talk Podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilmy Works. <laughs>